Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to our annual Mega Trends Payments webinar events. Today we're focusing on the Americas, including US, Canada, and Latin America. Uh, my name is Lindsay Lear. I'm the Managing Director of Payments and Commerce Market Intelligence. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to be uh, sharing this space once again as an opportunity to share insights, to share some thought leadership, and collectively view and follow the trends that are that are shaping our industry. We have a fantastic uh, set of content for you today, some fantastic speakers, uh, and I'm really just thrilled to kick off the year. It's already at the end of February, hard to believe, um, but we're so uh, thrilled to be kicking off um, once again another, I think this is our fifth annual Mega Trends event. Um, so welcome and um, We'll, we'll go through a couple of quick um, logistical points before we dive into the content. So let's go ahead and move ahead. Uh, very quick legal notice, please, uh, as you always do, keep the information that you receive today um, in mind with many other sources and when using sound business practices. Okay, let's go ahead. Really, barely a quick intro on PCMI. Payments and Commerce Market Intelligence is the leading advisory firm for Fortune 500 companies and many others in the payments industry globally. Um, we have over 30 years experience uh, providing market intelligence and services to companies of all sizes, uh, primarily in Latin America for the past uh, the majority of our career, but as many of you know, in the past several years, we have uh, expanded to the global stage today, covering over 50 markets um, and a network of consultants, um, which is growing by the week. Um, our key services uh, include market intelligence and helping companies make key decisions that they need to run their business successfully, which is incredibly difficult in an industry that is constantly changing thanks to technology, regulatory changes, and consumer shifts. So we're here to support you in, in making those decisions and getting the, that clarity you need. Going ahead, real quick snapshot as to where we are today. We have PCMI teams in 13 global cities today. This is very exciting for us, and we're thrilled to this year for the first time be doing a three-series webinar event covering Af America's EMEA and APAC happening uh, today and tomorrow. You guys will receive more information on that at the end of the webinar. Uh, but we are growing, um, as I said, on a weekly and monthly basis in terms of our collaborators, our geographic coverage, and our overall understanding and depth of, of really expertise of the payments industry around the world. And then finally, if we go ahead, um, just to give everyone a better understanding of what we actually do and how we help clients. Our key mission and our key objective is to help you have the information and the insight you need to successfully navigate the payments industry. And that really boils down to making decisions, right? Understanding and deciding which opportunity to invest in, which market to, to enter and how, how to pivot, how to launch a new product. What does that uh, market product match? Who to acquire with our partner so that you can be as the best you can be and continuing to compete again in this industry that is going under rapid change and um, is, is completely dynamic and complex uh, around the global stage. Okay, so um, one more slide I believe we have. And um, so uh, as part of this, uh, we every year do our mega trend series and then we combine that with additional series and, and insight sharing throughout the year. So we're so thrilled to be here uh, presenting this information to you today. Um, I would love to introduce uh, my co-speakers, my, my co-presenters here, starting off with Cesar. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And easy, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Cesar Borali. I have been with PCMI, uh, I would say for the past seven, eight months. Um, very glad to be here. And I think we have uh, a very uh, insightful session ahead of us. Thank you, Cesar. And also joining us is Marina Gil. Hello, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Very glad to have you all here. Uh, my name is Marina Gil. I work for PCMI for several years now, based in Brazil. And I hope you enjoy the session and that the content we're going to present can help you navigate this 2024. Thank you. Terrific. All right. So I think we're ready to begin our formal presentation. If we go ahead. Um, what we're going to do today is to attempt to 
explain and provide insight on several trends that we're observing in the Americas region. I would say the most most of our conversation today will be focused on Latin America, but increasingly we're seeing synergies with the U.S. market as well. So we are going to cover some insights there. So just to get us started, right, just to lay the base work and the groundwork for our discussion, we're just going to look at some key data points. So if we go ahead, um, let's go back. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right. So putting the Americas in the world context, right, we part of the wonderful benefits of expanding beyond Latin America as PCMI is getting to understand regions in a de better on the on the global stage and in a global context. And that's been really enlightening and fascinating for us and for our clients. And so when we look at the payment method mix around the world, this is specifically looking at e-commerce. This is a combination of World Pan FIS data combined with PCMI's own analysis. Looking into 2026, we can see start to see these divergences in, around the world, right? Um, and that color coding that you see is which payment method is going to be the leading payment method by 2026. And so we look at the Americas, we look at wallets and, and Latin America, we see wallets um, eking out in front of cards. Now, again, those are that's going to be Apple Pay and Google Wallet, PayPal, for example, which very much rely on card rails, just that the wallet is kind of leading in terms of that user experience and branding experience. And in Latin America, cards are still forward, um, even with all the disruption that we are experiencing with real-time payments, wallets, et cetera, cards still maintain their primacy in, include when we think about credit and debit together. Um, and so it's great to put some of these trends, these hot button topics into, into perspective, okay? Going ahead. Um, again, just to uh, get some basic numbers, what is really exciting about really uh, much of the world at this point, but Latin America and the U.S., is looking at financial and technology penetration. Uh, today, you will see not that much of a difference between smartphone, internet, and bank account penetration between U.S. and North American markets. And that's a new phenomenon. Um, if you followed us, you followed our conversation on financial inclusion, and we've monitored and tracked how accelerated Latin America has become in financial inclusion. But the point is that even in emerging markets in LATAM and around the world, smartphone penetration is there. And in most cases, financial account penetration is also there, which gives us a wonderful framework and baseline upon which to digitize, upon which to innovate and continue to um, deliver innovative solutions um, in, in new ways. Okay, we go to the next one. Looking at e-commerce, e-commerce is a great bellwether for how fast a market is moving and how developed a market is, right? We continually, as consumers, we continue to invest more of our purse each month to digital payments on online shopping uh, as more different verticals become uh digitized and we start to interact on the mobile phone and start to consume in different ways. So you can see, you know, just how different in scale these markets are, right? North America um, in the trillions um, and one of the largest in the world. But you can see that growth has started to plateau, right? Whereas in Latin America, we have a smaller market, uh, but we see still massive uh, growth rates at 26% through 2026. That growth has come down from a peak during the during and right after the pandemic, but we're still seeing double digit, very impressive growth across almost every market in Latin America, which speaks to the underpenetrated nature of digital payments still taking place in in that region. Even though we have uh, almost universal access to technology, that penetration of daily use is still uh, relatively low. So we have a continual a continued large uh, runway to continue to continue observing. Okay. So I think if we go to the next one, um, we these given that context, and hopefully that's helpful in just setting the 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 baseline for where we are today. As we go into um, our discussion, we're going to be focusing on three topics, which are all very connected. You are probably all quite familiar with these. We've been talking about them and presenting data for a long time, but we're going to provide a fresh perspective um, on 2024, what we think is going to, what is and will happen in A to A payments and RTPs, cross-border payments and open banking and how that's connected to open finance, open data, and finally digital ID. So um, 
I think Marina is going to take us through this first section. So I will uh, turn it over to her. Perfect, thank you. So let's get started uh, with this first uh, trend we are observing, which is account to account in real-time payments. As Lindsay said, this is not something new, but it's, it keeps reshaping the landscape, the payment landscape in the region in different situations and different uh, formats throughout the region, but it's still very important uh, for the money movement flows in terms of reducing the banking fees and also promoting further promoting the financial inclusion and the usage of the system, right? If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, I just wanna give a first overview of how RTPs are being developed in the region, right? We see it's a rise and it's boosting in, in, in Latin, also in US, you're gonna see further that US is a little behind than Latin America. But uh, the idea here is to show you guys how the, the types of RTP systems being implemented are different in several ways, in, in the usage, in the impacts on the short and medium term, and also in who is implementing what. So if you see this chart here, you, you're gonna see that some markets as Brazil and Mexico, for example, the RTPs are being handled by the government, right? You have PIX, Demo, Cody, all uh, based on reliance on uh, relying on the government uh, support and they are the ones promoting the system, right? You have some mixed situation in countries as US, for example, you have Zelle, Vemo, that are private or con bank consortium. And now you have FedNow that is part of the government initiative, right? The same with Argentina that you have Modo and then Transferencia 3.0. Uh, and we have other, other markets where we are basically relying on private initiatives to support the real-time payments, right? Especially here, we have Chile with March, we have Peru with Plin and Yape, also uh, Canada that just uh, implemented the indirect online, which is also a private uh, initiative, right? So as you can see, uh, the RTPs are growing very fast. It's still double digit, digit and beyond 20% in all the region, in all, in all of the markets in the region. We have here, for example, PIX, that we speak a lot about PIX, we're gonna get more in depth, but uh, that is now going to the other, another stage, let's call another level of the RTP's usage now uh, going for the recurring payments. And in, on medium terms, we start to see conversations about credit, also disrupting credit access, not only the payment per se, right? Uh, if you go to Fed now, uh, we see that Fed now, at, it's a bit different from PIX, especially at, in this first moment, because it's more related to the B2B uh, and, removing the, the reliance uh, on the legacy systems, right? In the US and allowing faster and more cost-efficient solution that the, the other providers will be able to then uh, provide to the, to the consumers, right? Uh, in Canada, we have Interact, there is a private rail, but uh, really focus on P2P and P2M. Uh, and the idea here is just to start allowing the RTPs, right? The same uh, uh, we have in Sintemovil that is, not new, but it's very, very well developed and use it in Costa Rica. Uh, and now the idea is to gain share over the cards and the other payment methods. PSE, we just brought it here because of it's a bit different. It's more focused on online transactions, but it's very important for Colombia. In Colombia, uh, specifically, we, we had a recent announcement of the government that they are partnering uh, with Brazilian government to get the best practices of PIX, and they just allow announce the Sistemas de Pagos Inmediatos, which is their RTP that will be more connected to, to PIX, right? So let's let's keep going. And uh, so I can show you what we are seeing uh, in terms of how we can kind of better understand this HOA payments. We see that they're going to an, what we are calling a new generation, right? The first phase, let's say the first generation of HOAs, they were mostly relying on fintechs, innovative companies, not government. Uh, they are mostly closed loop, not necessarily real time uh, and not focused in other use case, but P2P, allowing transfers uh, people to people and mostly closed loop. As you see, Davi Plata in Neki in Colombia, you have Vemo and our RTP in US, Zelle, that it's, it's still closed loop because not all the big banks are part of it, but if some someone else joins this the, the, the scenario, this cannot be considered interoperable. And what we see is like the big 
difference and what is really new is the interoperability, right? That's what PIX brought to Brazil. For example, what we have with Simpemove and Demo that we're gonna explain better uh, further is getting to Mexico as well, right? So the idea is like you start by closed loops, uh, trying to improve the experience, the payment and the transfers uh, experience. And then you really go to another level, focus on consumer and user experience, a seamless payment, very instantaneous, uh, low cost specifically as well. And this interoperable is very important. And that's where it's very important to have the presence of central banks and regulators uh, in the movement of bringing this HOA systems, right? Um, we just want to call out here uh, FedNow, Sistemas de Pagos Inmediatos, Preferencias 3.0. They are all in this new generation, but at first they are more focused on the infrastructure, right? The backstage of the HOAs. But of course, this will bring improvement for the final consumer as well, right? And thinking forward, right? This is where we are. This is what we can already see, this new generation. But we have another move coming. And honestly, since things are moving so fast, uh, it should be really not medium term, probably short term, you're gonna see some of those impacts in terms of not relying on P2P only, but expanding to P2B and B2B use cases. The same with recurring pay payments, the offline transactions that can help a lot with the financial inclusion and usage. And which is the most exciting for me is the cross-border payments uh, becoming a real reality in terms of HUA and a seamless experience that we're gonna further, further mention. Uh, in the next slide, we we can really show you the star of the arch uh, the RTPs in the region, and I guess it's a global example as well. Everyone heard about Pix and how it changed uh, the Brazilian landscape. And I was thinking here, uh, I don't know how would be my life without Pix anymore because I use that. I mean, on a daily basis, and I, I don't know how we managed to do that. You know, pre pre Pix. So, and this is really showing in this chart here. If you if you see. Uh, Pix was launched in November 2020, uh, and it grow. The grow was like really um, exponential throughout all the years, and the gain shared among against all other payment methods. Right? You see boletos that we we, we called voucher, but it was like something that we used a lot in Brazil. You barely hear about that for P2P and, and in-person transactions anymore. Uh, debit cards and credit cards. I mean, uh, TEDs, that was the prior bank transfer systems with the low, uh, high cost, peaks gain share overall, and now represents around 36% of all transactions made in Brazil, which is pretty impressive, right? Uh, and if you see in terms of volumes, it's also uh, something that uh, amuses us because last year, peaks summed more than 3.6 trillion in transactions, right? In the second quarter, just that we are highlighting here, surpassed card volume by far, you know, in a matter of 700 billion to 164 billion. So uh, really peaks in general surpassed cards. And what it's giving a zoom in P2M, which the, the person to merchant, like the volume of peaks already surpassed debt cards by 77 billion for peaks and around 50 billion transactions for debt cards. It is still a little behind the uh, credit cards, but what you see is that the growth rate of PIX is very higher than cards. PIX is growing around 14% versus 5% for credit cards. So nobody knows, but uh, it, it tends, it shows that probably PIX will also catch up on, on cards and, and on credit cards. And this only the P2M piece of it, which represents around 10% of PIX. So this is just showing how impressive and how quick everything changes. Marina, just one thing to compliment here is that one thing we've observed since the launch of PIX is that P2M transactions have consistently maintained around 10% share of total PIX volume. That number was 10% after a couple months of launching and it is still 10%. It's kind of fascinating to watch that share uh, modulate just just a tiny bit, but that just tells us that P2M is growing at the same rate of PIX overall. Um, you know, which is pretty impressive as PIX starts to get used more and more for B2B or for government uses. Um, that has that share hasn't declined, so it's continually to be adopted by more merchants, um, more share of our weekly expenditure um, going to PIX. So just that's an interesting call out. Exactly. 
a good good catch. Uh, this is this is very very interesting to to see because as you said, governments are accepting taxes uh, payments with PICs, which higher volumes, and it's still P two M are growing at the same level. So, meaning that they are growing even faster, right? So yeah, uh, what I'll, I'll I'll go to the next slide because uh, what is still uh, very impressive on PICs and the Brazilian Central Bank is that they never stopped, right? Uh, PICs did all these changes the way we operate here in Brazil, but it's still the roadmap is pretty aggressive. They and they keep saying and including new features uh, in the roadmaps and on the development, right? So for this year, we have a very interesting one, which is being called PICS Automatic that will allow recurring payments, right? It's It should be launched by October 2024. This is the, the date Central Bank announced. It. And this uh, can change the life of a portion of the population, for example, that doesn't have access or has access, but not enough limits of credit cards, for example, to pay for subscription that you use on a daily basis as Spotify, Netflix, and so on. And now you're going to be able to do that with PIX, which is something very, uh, that the merchants and everyone was really waiting for that. And now it's going to be live. Uh, and honestly, uh, I think, and market experts are, are very enthusiastic about that to see how this is going to behave and mainly to bring these people uh, to the system and being able to use on a daily basis something that they couldn't without picks, right? They had to, hide, to to use someone else's cards and so on. So this is a very interesting uh, evolution of picks. The other one that is in the roadmap is the picks offline that I mentioned. This is you will be able to do transactions even without an internet connection. Uh, and this is, uh, although everyone has smartphones and so on, it's still they're a part of population without uh, the internet connection 24 seven as fix this. And now with that, they're gonna be able to use uh, and make transfers uh, without this connection. And again, this is beyond the financial inclusion. This is the financial usage, the usage of the system and allowing people that join the system to really use it whenever they want, right? Um, one thing that is uh, being we are hearing a lot is PIX International, uh, allowing for cross-border transactions, right? I think this is more complex than other evolutions of PIX because it's not totally dependent on the Brazilian government, uh, but there are work, uh, work streams on that. And we have a related uh, initiative that is global called uh, Nexus Project by the International Settlement Bank. Uh, they are testing that. Brazil is not part of the test. You have central banks of Italy, Malaysia, and Singapore uh, testing this Nexus project. But the idea is to have 60 uh, countries all connected, allowing these cross-border payments. This is very, you know, sounds something very different. But if central banks really manage to do that, this could be the next game changer in the way people move money, you know, uh, around the globe. Because it's not limited to one market as fixes but this is you know more to come and and to have an our eyes uh, on that and see how this this is going to be the evolution uh these mentioned the test they should end by this year so let's see uh and keep monitoring that and the other one is fix step to pay the ability to use contactless technology via pix as well as we are currently doing with cards right so this is more to show that Pix changed the way we lived. Other real-time payments on the region are following the steps of Pix. Then take Pix took the lead, and everyone, other governments are now in doing the inroads to get the same. But it's still, it has not stopped. And this is the beauty of the thing. I mean, more to come. And if you see all good uh, innovations, let's say, and additional features that can really change the way we operate, it's still we think that. Everything is done, but this payment industry is like more features to come and more, you know, uh, opportunities for the population to get an idea of better uh, and have better use, use experience and easy. I mean, payments being part of the daily, uh, the daily usage as something else, nothing very difficult. And I think uh, the next slide, like I'm going to ask Lindsay to share her idea uh, ideas and what she's seeing in Mexico that is completely different up to now from Brazil. Yes, absolutely. So Brazil is a fascinating case study that everyone around the world is observing. We get questions from countries all over the world to understand what did PICS do right and why has it succeeded? 
And we can see how PIX is comparing to other schemes around around the region. So DEMO, uh, which was launched this year, is kind of the re Cody reinvented, right? Cody was the instant payment scheme launched um, by the Mexican Central Bank in 2019. Now, Mexico has already had instant bank account rails for many years, SPAY. Most of you are familiar with SPAY. Cody was a QR code application on top of SPAY to enable instant P2P and, and purchases. It, it really didn't go anywhere. Um, and today, um, it, we can say it's pretty much flatlined. Um, the central bank has come back and tried to reinvent Cody, which was D DEMO or Dinero Mobile, um, which the, the main improvement there is that it has, instead of based on QR codes, it now connects your bank account to a phone number, to your phone number, so that you can make a very easy P2P payment, which is the model that many RTPs systems around the world have followed. So there are good signs that DEMO will be more successful. Um, but it's also very speculative because DEMO is also not following many of the best practices exhibited with PICS, such as it is uh, optional. It is not obligatory for financial institutions to participate. There is not one unified UX requirement or standard for banks to follow when enabling DEMO. So users might have a different uh, uh, flow or journey every time they try to access DEMO and bank issuers or banks can try to put DEMO in different screens of their app, which can be confusing. There is no heavy marketing or, or branding by either the central bank or financial institutions yet. Um, and there's still no clear economic incentives for banks, right? With PICS, in, a, in making a P2M purchase, um, there is the opportunity to earn around 1% commission on those transactions, even though P2P is free. Um, in, in the case of DEMO, that hasn't yet been defined. Uh, things are working um, um, at a, on a free basis right now. And there is a little bit of lack of clarity from the regulators if that's ever going to change or or really what the, what the intention is there. So there's a lot of speculation. There are a lot of things up in the air. We do believe that this is an improvement, um, especially good signs by Nubank launching DEMO, BBVA and Santander, huge and in major institutions in the country launching it. Um, but it, it's still very, very early days. There are no official data, and we'll continue to watch it throughout throughout this year. So back to you. True. Yeah, let, let's go to, to the orange light, and uh, I'd like to have uh, Cesar telling us a bit more about U.S. and Fed now and what he's seeing in the region. Cool. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Marina. Um, yeah, so I think you guys uh, briefly mentioned about the, the Fed now. Um, there's a lot of expectation around Fed now, and, and the idea here is kind of like to compare what we see as the, the challenges and the opportunities for Fed now. Uh, so one thing that uh, stands out in the very beginning, it's the, uh, especially when we compare Fed now with Peaks and, and other RTPs across the globe, is that um, uh, the, the Fed uh, isn't marketing Fed now as a consumer solution, right? Or, or as a consumer brand. Uh, so it, it has been uh, adopted by some banks already. I think we have uh, a little a little less than 500 banks in the U.S. Uh, out of the 9,000 uh, financial institutions that they have in the U.S. Um, already implementing Fed now, which is roughly 5%. Um, but it's it, we we don't have the same uh, marketing aspect as we have in Peak. So uh, the whole even the whole constitution in the U.S. Uh, and and the way that they have uh, the the states empowered to to push down those initiatives uh, is somehow prohibits the, the the at the federal level uh, the Fed now to be uh, mandated to to consumers and to banks. Um, so we do see a lot of opportunity, especially considering that uh, the overall money movement in the U.S. it's it's fairly slow. Uh, it's still heavily dependent on ACH, um, which there is uh, kind of like a low cost for, especially for the the businesses carrying out those those ACH costs. But in terms of speed, it limits the 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 speed. Uh, uh, of actually the movement of funds, but also to uh, to support further innovations, right? So uh, one thing that we keep saying about the RTPs in general is that it's, it's not just about the speed of of the of the funds movement, right? It's creating the rail, creating the messaging, the interoperable system that uh, will actually uh, you know serve as a platform for banks and fintechs to innovate uh, and to create new products. So I think that's uh, I think that's a, a big takeaway for us. 
uh, I think the in terms of challenges, they will they will face very strong competition because of they are coming late to the, to this game. They will face very strong competition from the wallets. So especially on the P2P side, Vemo, Cash App, Zelle, PayPal, they have been uh, established as the the go to uh, apps for for P2P transfers, right? So it's uh, I think they're going to have a long way to go, uh, convincing the banks to push this down to consumers. Um, also bringing, trying to bring fintechs, uh, which were not part of the original scope of Fed, uh, of Fed now, but bringing fintechs into the game. And the idea would be to provide a better UX and, and somehow provide the infrastructure to, for fintechs and even the banks uh, to further innovate. So next slide, please. Um, then what, what we have here, kind of like the, the side effect, uh, and, and uh, I think that that happens across all the markets, but uh, one thing that uh, I think all the, the RTPs are trying to figure out, it's going to be the how they will deal with uh, anti-fraud, uh, chargebacks, commercial disputes. Um, I think very uh, key things that are addressed by uh, the card network. So I think they have a lot of experience dealing with those kinds of situations. Uh, zero liability protection, disputes, chargebacks. There is already a network and a process in place to solve those issues. Uh, and with RTP, uh, clearly it's not a, it's not the role of the government to to get involved on the on those disputes and 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 even like the the kind of like the the ruling of those uh, uh, issues. So I think there is still uh, a lot to evolve in that front. Uh, also, in, and especially for the highly uh, card-driven markets such as the U.S., uh, we do see the incentive programs and the cashback and rewards as one of the key things for people to, to keep using their cards. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting to, to understand how RTPs will uh, also evolve uh, towards, I think, fraud and the security aspect uh, incentives. I think it's, a, it's a, also an important topic. Um, convenience, uh, like integrating with those type of tokenized wallets, Apple Pay, uh, Samsung Pay, those kind of things, which makes the card usage very convenient today. And uh, last but not least, I think international acceptance, right? How they take the, the domestic acceptance to the international level, how people can also replace their cards when they are uh, traveling internationally or they are buying from an international website. Um, I think that's um, that's the leverage that the card networks have today. And we're going to see how the RTPs will catch up with that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and the, um, and the, the last slide I have here, I think it's uh, more focused towards SMEs. Uh, first, uh, when we talk about SMEs, we have a very uh, large range of companies as well. We have very small companies and we have uh, medium sized companies that uh, traditionally have very different uh, needs and, and ways to, to access the, the financial systems and the financial solutions available in the market. Uh, what we see here is that, uh, generally speaking, there is a faster uh, financial inclusion in the region. So we see that when we compare the, the, the world that has, came, has come from 68% of the, the financial inclusion to 76 in 2021, uh, Latin, Latin America has grown from 55 to 75. Um, it, I think the pandemic had a lot to a lot to do with that, uh, as it affected the other countries as well. But I think we saw uh, a huge impact in Latin America. In terms of um, the the payment methods and how RTPs can help uh, SMEs to uh, to evolve uh, into a, a more like digital uh, landscape. Um, we see that uh, a lot of the, the SMEs in the region uh, already accept uh, either the RTP or some, some sort of alternative uh, mean of payment. So 95% of the companies in, in the SMEs in Brazil uh, accept PIX, uh, also associated with uh, a higher uh, bank account penetration and, uh, and I think a lower uh, cash penetration. Um, we see kind of like a similar pattern uh, in, in Colombia with NACI uh, and almost half of those companies accepting PSE. Um, Mercado Pago in Argentina uh, being a, a highly popular uh, wallet, uh, Modo, and then uh, in Mexico is Pay as the main, main uh, uh, 
payment method uh, with code if being uh, still uh, very low. Um, so it's it's the I think one thing that we see very clearly is that uh, you know those alternative means of payments, especially RTP, it provides lower costs, uh, better UX, and it's also uh, heavily pushed by the consumer preference. So a lot of those. SMEs are, are, are having that as, as a priority in terms of uh, their payment methods. Uh, as they get more digital, uh, that, that, uh, that low, lower cost alternative uh, makes a lot of sense for them. Uh, I think I, I hand it back to, to Marina. Yeah, let's go to the other, to the other trend. Thank you, Cesar. So uh, the other trend we are observing is the cross-border, right? All that we already mentioned and this global money movement, what is changing in the region. So if we keep going, we see that Latam is a very important region in terms of cross-border flows. It's the second biggest region uh, receiving remittances with 156 billion received in 2023. And the biggest, the, the main star here is Mexico, which is the second largest beneficiary worldwide, receiving 67 billion uh, in remittances in 2023, right? Uh, the biggest uh, thing to highlight here is that it's still more than a half, around 57% of all these flows are not captured uh, digitally. It's not digitalized, it's all doing cash. So here we have a room, a big room for fintechs and other plays to provide innovation and to capture that and bring uh, this towards the financial system, right? Not the, the cash base, but it's still a lot of room that needs improvement and there are space for players to bring and capture this flow, right? If we see in, in the next slide, uh, LATAM is the second biggest region, but it was the region that with the highest growth rate in 2020, 2023, growing 8%, right? Uh, and if we see here in Latam, the uh, U.S. continues to be the biggest uh, sender, right, of receiver. And Mexico is the second uh, market uh, in terms of volume received by U.S., uh, only behind India. Okay, and we, we also have to, to put an eye on Colombia, because Colombia is also a very important receiver of remittances in Latin America. And what calls attention is that US represents more than 90% of the flows into Mexico and around 50% to Colombia, because Colombia also relies on, on flows from Spain uh, as, the second, uh, as the second center and Chile, which is very interesting that connects with uh, something that calls our attention is that Chile is the, on the, the only market in the region that has a different profile in terms of uh, remittances because their outbound flows are higher than the inbound. And basically because of the economic situation, right? More developed, uh, the more stable economy and so on. Uh, and Chile is really sending flows mainly to Argentina, Peru and Colombia, right? We see that the interflow regions uh, in Latin are still not uh, that connected as we're gonna see in other regions uh, in a moment, but we see Chile as one uh, one player, let's call, trying to connect uh, the dots here for, for the markets. Um, because for example, if you see Brazil, which is uh, not a big flow, but in terms of where the remittances come from, it's basically worldwide. We have US as the first uh, sender and then Japan, uh, Portugal and Italy. It's, we see like the, one of the, the biggest economy of the region that is not promoting the, the inter-regional the inter flows. So this is something that's called our attention. And I would like to, to see Lindsay, if you have uh, some comments about, because we see that in Asia and even Africa happening much better in terms of bilateral and even multilateral agreements for the interflows. If you can tell us. Yeah, I actually think this is very interesting. If if we look at Europe, there's uh, many different initiatives to unite the Eurozone. This has been happening for decades. But uh, beyond government is government initiatives, there's private fintech and bank uh, multilateral uh, agreements to connect different schemes, as well as several projects um, to uh, the SEPA payment rails, which span Europe, and then other ways to integrate non-Euro denominated markets. There's there's multiple initiatives taking place in Europe. In Asia, there's uh, several, uh, by the same token, there's already QR code interoperability between Thailand, 
um, Malaysia, um, Singapore, and several other markets. You have connectivity between UPI and India and Singapore. So this, these are already taking place and they're already advanced. So when we look at Latin America, we're a little bit behind in that way. And, you know, that's there might be many reasons for it. I think um, immigration flows in those other regions are much, there's a lot of intra-regional immigration more so than in Latin America. There's more intra-regional business flows um, happening in those regions. Um, but of course, there are intra-regional flows in Latin America, which really represents a big opportunity. There is not a lot of innovation or a lot of focus on those flows, both P2P and also for small businesses. So a lot of learning can be had by looking at other regions. Um, and there are, of course, multi- you know, banks and fintechs that span almost the entire region. So certainly there is opportunity for there. And, and we see that as kind of an area that, that could be really exploited. Oh, perfect. Makes sense. And this is exactly what we are we're bringing in the next, uh, in the, the next slide um, that we show. What we see is like the biggest issues that we have when doing cross-border payments is like the lack of visibility. It's very complex, right? You don't know when you're going to receive the money, how, how much exactly you're going to receive um, and also it's, uh, I mean, people that are not used with the system, uh, really don't know how, how to access it. And this is where we see the innovation coming again, as we saw with the HUAs and RTPs, fintechs bringing the solution at first, right? Not the government. If you see here, uh, in Latin, uh, what we see these players such as WISE, Global 66, Space and Nomad, they, they are changing the way people can make this cross-border uh, transactions, right? But it, it's really focused on a specific uh, demographic. Let's call the travelers, high-income people, uh, freelancers. And this really helps when you go up, uh, abroad with your card, you can use and pay as if you were using uh, your own account. This helps a lot, but it's really a specific use case, right? And as you were mentioning in the, pri in the prior slide, uh, there is a flow not being captured yet, right? You have very little innovation for the low income and the, the immigrants, as you mentioned, although it's not as strong as in Europe, we are starting to see a lot of, you see, for example, Bolivians and Venezuelan, Venezuelans throughout uh, Brazil and other markets specifically here as immigrants and how they are accessing this, how they are dealing with the, this uh, money movement, right? And also the SMBs, uh, both to receive and send remittances is it still uh, not a focus of any of this you know, initiative. So it's still, we have l l a lot of evolution and innovation that came for a specific niche. Let's call the ones that is the, the, the heavy users of this cross-border uh, transactions, but it's still, we have a uh, lot to do and, and a, a long way to, long path to be covered. And what we really, I really like to do this parallel is like uh, when the government decided to really put a hands on and make speaks, for example, and work on the real time payment, they change the game, right? And now, I mean, if they are able to do the same with the cross border payments, with the Nexus projects, or with peaks in Brazil, specifically the work, work stream of international transactions, this will be really a wider um, approach and they will reach out to much more people. And this will, in my opinion, can be the next uh, second change that we see in terms of payments, as we see, we saw with Pix, like the way our daily lives were easier, became easier. This could be the, the next uh, big change, depending on how the governments are gonna be able to, to put that in place, right? Um, the other thing that happened a lot is like, do all this that I mentioned, like the cost, the lack of transparency, uh, the, how hard it is to make the funds, it also opens room to crypto, right? Stable coins, you use them for remittances because a crypto fees tends to be lower and it's very, uh, it's faster. So Cesar, if you could tell us how is the evolution of the CBDCs throughout the region or the usage of cryptos for the remittances would be good. Thank you, Marina. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so, so this is kind of like a, a big picture of uh, where uh, the region is uh, with regards to a CBDC adoption. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see the countries where uh, the, the, I think they are still at the, the research uh, phase and studying the, the, the feasibility of adopting a digital currency. Um, then in the middle, you see, uh, I think, 
uh, very key markets uh, for the region that are uh, kind of like uh, completing the research phase, uh, which is an important uh, step uh, towards the launch of the of, the, of digital currencies. Uh, you see Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, and Mexico with uh, more advanced uh, initiatives. Um, and then on the on the right hand side, we see the countries where uh, CBDCs are live. Uh, and I think here it's worth to mention that I think the 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 main goal for those uh, governments creating the CBDC was actually to help with financial inclusion, uh, which we we hasn't we haven't seen that uh, materialized yet. Uh, so we there is no uh, I think real proof of com concept that uh, CBDCs will actually uh, improve financial inclusion. Um, so I think there are a number of use cases we're gonna I think we'll be exploring some of the use cases better in the next slides. Um, so uh, next one, please. Uh, so in this in this particular case for Brazil, uh, what we see, uh, like I said, is that uh, we don't see um, we don't see that uh, as, as we don't see financial inclusion as the as the main goal for the digital currency. I think the the way that in particular for Brazil, the way that they have created the, for example, the payment institution framework that allowed. Uh, pretty much every fintech to hold deposits on behalf of clients. I think that uh, has helped a lot with the financial inclusion. I think that uh, has provided better, better banking services and account services to a lot of the population. Uh, but we do see a big opportunity for, for Drex to uh, help uh, with, uh, with financial transactions as a whole uh, in, in, in the sense of uh, tokenized transactions. So helping to uh, all those capital market transactions, all those different uh, FX transactions, cross-border payments that uh, usually have one or even more intermediaries in the flow. Uh, having a digital currency uh, that is uh, actually settled through a decentral decentralized way uh, can help a number of use cases. So if we get, for example, uh, here like the, the payment versus payment transactions, uh, or the delivery versus payment transactions for uh, trade uh, uh, deals, for example. Uh, so it can be very helpful to have a, a mechanism where uh, buyers and sellers uh, can trust uh, uh, that uh, the the value of the products. Uh, you know, first I think that the it's it's the, the digital representation of something that it's actually available to them, which is currents. And second is that the clearing process uh, can be facilitated by a number of rules. So I think in that sense, uh, we do see a lot of opportunities for, for the CBDCs uh, as a whole. So ne next one, please. Uh, yeah, so I think now we, we're gonna move over to open banking, uh, open finance and digital ID. I think very uh, well-connected uh, topics as well. So as we move from like RTPs into uh, cross-border remittance, uh, CBDCs, I think it's it's a natural step for us to get into the open banking and the data space. Uh, so I, I will hand it over back to you, Marina. Thank you. So uh, let's go to, to the next one, just to, as Heather mentioned, it's all very well connected. And the idea here is just to show we are in different stages in terms of open finance in the region as well. And what does that mean in Brazil again? Uh, taking the lead, it's already a reality. We have that uh, in place, uh, payment initiation, data sharing, the protection laws, everything already implemented. US is developed, but mainly via private initiatives such as played. We have Mexico that is really go, uh, going slow. Let's say started in 2018, but up to now, nothing is very defined. So uh, we see the players waiting for that, but it's still very embryonary. And then Colombia that just started, but uh, the, the good thing is that by next last year, uh, the data protection uh, law is being developed and the government included uh, open finance as the main strategies, one of the, the development plans. So more to come, but it's still uh, early development here. Uh, let's keep going. So I can just very briefly, when you talk about open finance, we have a lot of doubts of what we're talking. And mainly we have to, to see this two, let's call bucket, which is the payment initiation feature and the data sharing. Payment initiation is when you consumers are able to start a payment transaction in one bank, but the transaction 
is going to be made by another another institution, right? For that, you need a very innovative uh, central bank that wants that is like working hard to include as many players as possible in the system because you can't be relying relying only in the banks, right? You should have the fintechs and other uh, other players and also the interoperable system to support and data sharing that allows cost, cost, customers to give permission to other players see your whole uh, historic that helps a lot in, in other use case that you're going to sell. But for that, we need a very strong data protection law. In case of Brazil, we have the LGPG that was approved that supported a lot of this, right? So let's keep going just to show uh, how this can really, uh, what are the use cases? And we see in terms of data sharing that I was mentioned, by allowing other players to see your historic in other institutions, this will, this will give you more spread access, meaning Companies can see your full historic credit historic, for example, instead of only what you, the movements you have within one institution. And this could be more assertive, lower costs, and can help a lot uh, in terms of the credit penetration and, uh, and the access of credit for the population, right? This data, data sharing also helps a lot when managing your portfolio, liquidity manager, you can see everything in one app and you can manage your portfolio, uh, your accounts, Moody assets or Moody banks in one, uh, in one institution, right? And the payment initiation is that really allows you to move. It's not only monitor, but you can really use your financial uh, management towards uh, different uh, players or institutions, but via one that you choose to, to operate with, right? Uh, let's see the, the concrete example uh, in the other, the next slide, but just, just very briefly how it works. This is the payment initiation when you can cash in, for example, Mercado Pago here, the, the idea is like you use your wallet, you're there, you need to cash in. Within Mercado Pago, since you shared your data, you choose from which bank or for which institution you wanna bring the funds. Mercado Pago will connect directly with this other institution. You select approve it, and then the, the, the funds are in your Mercado, Mercado Pago wallet in this case, right? The other case is in the next slide is uh, to make payments and transfers, right? Here uh, we have uh, Itaú as the payment initiation. So you select uh, the bank or the institution where you want the payment to be made, but using your Itaú app. And then Itaú connects directly with new bank. In this case here, uh, you approve the transaction. New bank makes the payment, but Itaú, you are still in your Itaú app and Itaú gives you the the proof, and here you, we highlighted Shane that payment initiation by Itaú. So this is this is very 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 simple and very convenient when using and doing online purchases and using your wallets. You 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 don't need to go and close one app and use another one, and you can manage your funds more uh, efficiently, right? In an efficient way. Uh, Cesar, if you could guide us uh, just to show like the data sharing example, so the that people could see the other use. Yeah, so so I I I think the for me the the beauty of open finance it's it's the how you can uh, first I think people need to understand uh, how financial institutions will access their data, what they're gonna do with their data, but as they see a real benefit of sharing their personal data. Uh, I think that's going to get a lot of traction, uh, not only in Brazil, but in, in other markets. Um, it's the, I think it, it, so you basically have two moments. I think the first moment is when you decide to share your, or your data with a specific institution and, and you have uh, a lot of, a lot of things that you can set with regard to that. If it's specific data related to accounts, related to credit, um, then with the open finance concept, you can even expand that into insurance and other things. Uh, but as you as you set those things and you share your data, uh, you allow that specific institution to uh, kind of like look through all your data and then come back to you with a more personalized uh, offer, right? So I think that's the uh, that's where uh, open finance can get a lot of traction, uh, depending on how good the the institutions will be uh, analyzing this data, compiling this data, and and ultimately providing you a better service. Um, 
So the, the, I think there is a data sharing aspect where you can uh, have visualization, you can have a uh, PFM, a personal financial manager, you can have a business financial manager, you can have a lot of aggregation and, and visualization around the data. But then you have, I would say, a, a must have complement, which is the payment initiation, that it's, also, uh, it's actually the rail which will make you uh, move funds from one account to, to another. Um, so I, I, I see this as, as one of the big trends we have within uh, open finance. All right, uh, so next one, please. Okay, so the so moving into a uh, digital ID, uh, which is also a topic that I'm, I'm heavily passionate. Uh, I think the, as the, the world moves into a multi-asset, uh, product, right? So people can have, they can have cards, they can have money in their account, they can have a multi-currency account, they can have Bitcoins, they can have other coins, they can have Drex, they can have CBDCs. Um, so I think a, a, a big thing will happen, especially in terms of like the core banking and the ledger systems for all the financial institutions that they need to be able to uh, carry out all, all those different types of assets. Uh, I think that's that's kind of like a, a trend that it's, I think it's undergoing right now. A lot of the, the fintechs and banks are in, the, in, in, in that uh, uh, type of space of creating this uh, multi-asset ledger. Uh, and then the, the second piece uh, very tied to that, it's um, how users uh, or how financial providers will actually uh, validate the ID, right? How, the, how they're gonna, um, give access to that uh, range of multi-assets. So if, if you want to buy something and you want to use uh, par, uh, like partially, you want to use a currents uh, or you want to use Bitcoins or you want to use half and half, uh, I think the biggest uh, point on, on all of that, it's gonna be the, 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 to validate your ID and, and how, how they make sure that you are you uh, and they can actually uh, allow you to transact this way. Um, so just kind of like a big stat here. So 20% of, of, the, of the whole e-commerce revenue in the region is lost to fraud. Uh, so it's, it's extremely relevant and it's, it's, fraud is a big problem in the region. Uh, Brazil, Mexico are very large markets that um, they do suffer a lot, uh, especially merchants end up uh, carrying out uh, a lot of the fraud cost. So uh, next slide, please. So we, we brought here some of the initiatives we have seen in the region with regard to digital ID. Uh, so the first one in Colombia, uh, so since November, 2020, there, there are a number of initiatives to, uh, uh, to increase uh, uh, the digital ID uh, um, usage in, in Colombia. Um, so I think that the first step for most countries, it's, it's actually to uh, allow uh, people like uh, uh, citizens to use a digital form of ID. So you don't have to actually carry your physical ID. I think that was kind of like the first, the first phase. And then the second phase is how you actually can use that digital ID to authenticate yourself uh, through like government websites, through like uh, income tax. Uh, uh, so kind of like those things I think are a natural path. Um, and then, uh, and then I think the, the last thing would be e-commerce and transactions and third-party apps in general. Uh, so moving to the next one. Um, then we have two another examples. Uh, same thing with, with Brazil. I think it's going down the same path with gov.com. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually an open protocol also for companies to use that uh, as a third-party uh, authentication service as you have like Google, Facebook, Apple, uh, you actually could have uh, an uh, ID that can be validated by the government. And, uh, and then I think the comparison here with the US, which I think it follows kind of like the same path of Fed now in the sense of uh, there is, I think there are a number of initiatives trying to boost digital ID, uh, but the, 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 the law in the US, it's heavily dependent on states and that sometimes can also slow down the process. Um, so the, so that's, that's one thing that it's worth to mention here. Um, so off to the, to the next one. Um, I think I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Lizzie, to, to wrap this up. Perfect. 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Cesar, so much. And Marina, guys, great, great insights and content here. We're just about um, at the end wrapping up kind of what, what sense do we make of all of this? There's a lot of information, a lot of content. And so we kind of have five key takeaways, right, to, to wrap up today. Um, first is RTPs, we see them trending towards government-run schemes all across the region. Uh, but UX, when things are run by the government, very often UX is, is, a, is a missing link. Brazil solved that very successfully, but UX is still a missing link in many markets in the region. And we also see that RTP really has a ceiling or a cap if it can't solve problems of fraud, disputes, and customer service, which have not yet become overly problematic, but will um, as these systems continue to grow, continue to be adopted, and continue to scale. And so um, that's an area for innovation, an area for <clears throat> uh, product development, and also kind of a ceiling that we see RTPs hitting. Number two is that credit will eventually and slowly over time detach from credit from, from plastics, right? Um, this is happening already as we see fintechs and banks innovating on top of RTP rails, um, offering credit lines that are not connected to a card, but rather connected to your bank account and enabled over PICs, for example. As open finance grows and open banking and uh, institutions are able to better offer personalized credit offers um, and your accounts are connected via an RTP scheme, that will be able to flow more seamlessly from a bank account rather than a credit line, a credit card. So banks and fintechs are getting more creative around credit. This is a more slow moving trend, but something that is definitely coming as, as Brazil kind of leads the way there. Um, open banking, uh, it, we saw, I, I loved those examples because especially for us in the US where we don't have a government led open banking initiative, it can be difficult to visualize, but this is, it is making slow progress in the region with Brazil. Uh, we really have some actual use cases with payment initiation, speeding up payments. This is going to push profit pools and payments away uh, towards lending, right? And away from payments because as open banking, as open banking and RTPs become more pervasive, it becomes more and more difficult to make money on payments. And this is going to naturally push business towards lending, which is one of the primary use cases of open banking, lending and other services that, that we highlighted on the slide there. Um, remittances remain a huge business, <clears throat> but there's very little innovation in intra-regional flows. We talked about this already. I think there's very under-tapped um, opportunity for intra-regional flows in Latin America, as well as for SMEs. Um, SWIFT, in the long term is going to stay intact because banks and financial institutions are using SWIFT for most of those larger cross-border transactions. Um, but CBDC innovation will eventually start to challenge SWIFT. Um, we're still a long way away from that, however. And then I think talking about financial inclusion, we saw that take place at mass scale in Latin America, but SMEs are probably the next wave driving continued uh, digitization, driving continued financial inclusion. As they continue to adopt wallets and RTP solutions, we see more of them taking an interest in digital payments, which will bring cash usage down. And that really creates an opportunity for governments and payment companies to seize that volume and innovate on top of it, uh, enable services for that newly digitized volume that will be take, that will be captured in this year and, and going forward. So um, we are over time. Um, we're just about to wrap up. I hope those key insights were, were powerful takeaways for you all. Um, and I want to um, give you all an opportunity to let us know how would you like us to engage with you, right? Um, we would love to have a call with you to understand how are you um, consuming this information? Um, do you need support on a specific project? Do you have a research need in mind already? Um, do you just want to kind of hash these out with us and understand them a little better? please take a moment to just um, review the poll. Let us know how we can reach out to you um, and how we can support you in um, understanding these trends and getting a little bit more concrete. So I'll leave that poll up for the, for just a moment, but I want to, we've been answering your questions throughout um, the webinar, but a couple of them are really worth answering live. And Cesar, I would, I was wondering if you could go to the question, um, Tanuja's question, what features especially in instant payments or RTPs, should fintech startups leverage in the coming 12 to 24 months with respect to B2B payments? You had a great answer. I wonder if you could elaborate on that for the group. 
Yeah, uh, so I think I think the, the real-time payments was uh, initially designed by uh, consumers, right? I think the, the like mobile transactions and like people signing funds instantly. And, and as we move towards the B2B cases, I think you have uh, different things that uh, come into play, right? So ERP integration, uh, reconciliation, uh, like beneficiary uh, bank account validation, those kind of things. Uh, they are usually not so relevant for consumers. Uh, we usually just need to transfer funds to someone else or, or like to small uh, uh, vendors. Uh, but as, as we talk about B2Bs and as we talk as RTPs potentially uh, replacing other bank transfers and other payment methods, I think those are things that come to mind as, as some priorities that should be addressed. Terrific. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for everyone who answered the poll. We got almost everyone in there, so thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of our session today. Thank you all very much. We just go to the next slide. I want to make sure you're aware and invite you to our other two sessions of this same Megatrends webinar happening tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern time or 2 p.m. for London time. That will be covering Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And then Wednesday evening here in Miami, 8 p.m. or Thursday morning in Singapore, Hong Kong time will be Asia Pacific. So we hope to see you there. Um, the register link, if you're not signed up for those sessions, is in the chat. So please take a moment to, to click on that and access that. And um, thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, we always love hashing these trends out and we'll be in touch um, in the next weeks um, to discuss more. Thank you, everyone.